Good evening. Good evening. As the preacher says, good morning, I'm saying good evening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm kind of uh, put in the uh, podium tonight. Uh, I didn't realize it until about uh, 10 minutes ago. So I'm, I'm going to give you the opening remarks and then uh, Aaron is going to come up and uh, introduce our guest speakers. But what I would like to introduce this about is something that when I went back to college and took some education courses and thought that I might like to get a teaching degree um, so that I could teach at the high school level, uh, I had to do a paper in one of my methods classes. And it was a paper that was based upon the built environment, the built environment. And all of this came about in the 1980s when President Reagan was in uh, the executive branch of government. He called for a commission and they, uh, the commission was put together because he wanted to see how we could improve education, what we could do to improve education. Because at, back in the 80s, there was a great discussion about how schools were failing. They were failing the students. And so um, he put together a commission. He allowed the, the uh, head of the commission to choose their own um, members that would serve on the commission with the chairman of that commission. And they came up with a paper that was entitled, A Nation at Risk, The Imperative for Educational Reform. And today we are still facing some of the same problems that edu public education faced in the 1980s. But what was the report about? One of the things that the report did was try to find ways to get students to be enthusiastic about the environment, the built environment in which they live. And to give you a perfect example, this back in the uh, uh, about 2000, when I went to these uh, educational classes, this was about the time that we started to look at the viaduct. Obviously, the viaduct is an important part of our built environment here in not just the community of Bel Air, but in all of Belmont County, even the state of Ohio. And back when we decided to form an organization, the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society, our organization was actually an outgrowth of what I had seen and read in the report of this commission uh, 20 years before we even formed. And what is, what is it that the built environment is? The built environment is what you see all around you. Buildings, bridges, uh, stone structures, towers. And how many times have people driven past the stone viaduct and simply took it for granted? And we did not want to see that happen. Our organization didn't want to see it to fall into decay and decline and ruin. And so we decided that it would be an important contribution to education to be able to preserve that structure so people could use it. People could see it. They could understand what it was built for, why it is important, why it is an important part of the built environment of our community. And uh, just this last week, I had the opportunity to go to Bel Air High School and speak to the photography class who is taking the viaduct as one of its projects that they can use as a part of their photographic displays that they're going to be presenting toward the end of the school year. So the built environment, I think, is what our speakers are going to talk about this evening. Aaron's going to speak to you about that portion of the program. Uh, but what I would like you to do is to keep in mind that the built environment 
is what I think, John, you folks are going to be talking about and why it's important that we know about it, why it's important that we protect it, and important as to why we should teach our young folks what it is and so that they will have an appreciation of the built environment because it really tells us a history of where we were and where we, you know, why was the bridge built? Well, you know, a lot of people probably didn't even understand that. But now today, through our efforts at educating the public and the school children about that, hopefully they'll have a better understanding. So at this time, first of all, welcome our guests, welcome all of you here this evening. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our library director, Aaron Rothenbuehler, who will introduce our, our guest speakers this evening. Thank you, Dan. And again, thank you all for coming out. We are really uh, honored to be able to do this, this series with the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society every year. This is our 10th year um, doing this partnership with them, and we couldn't do it without, we couldn't put this series on without them. So um, again, we're very, very grateful to them for doing this with us. So a few quick announcements before we get started. Um, if you're new to the library, the bathrooms are down the hall uh, to the left, the women's on the left and the men's on the right there. Um, I do ask, and we usually do this at the very beginning of the program, but we had to switch things up today. And I heard, I heard somebody's phone, but I do ask that everybody silence their cell phones at this time so that uh, our respect for our speakers. And uh, the programs are being live streamed. That's where you see all this equipment here. And they are available to view after the program on our website. So if you go to our homepage and click on the Great Stone Viaduct, education series, there are links to the individual programs in that listing there, so you can watch those online. Okay, um, I'm going to run through these quickly. Thank you for having a library card. Those of you that you don't, those who you, or those who you do, those of you who don't, it's really easy to get one, and you can even be from across the river in West Virginia. I see a few West Virginia faces in here. We welcome you. You can have a library card and you can check out our books and our resources online with that. Um, and then again, on Thursdays at 5 p.m. and Friday mornings at 10 a.m. or 10.30 a.m., we have our little bookworms uh, story time for kids three to five. They do a story and a craft. It's a lot of fun. And um, on that back table, we also have set up our information about the Belmont County Imagination Library, which is through uh, with Dolly Parton's um, her philanthropy, and it gives all kids under the age of five one book, one free book a month until they reach the age of five. So newborns to four years, 11 months. It's free. Um, you can enroll your kids or your grandkids in that. And um, there are registration forms back there. If you'd like to sponsor a child, it's $25 that uh, for a year. That'll get kids 12 books. Um, just $25. Okay, um, next week at the Great Stone Viaduct Lecture Series, we have the inception of the new Bel Air Industrial Technology Training Center, and that's with the training director, Jason Dean, and architect, Wendy Scatterday. Um, that covers that uh, Union Local 83, and it covers five counties, and um, all the rest of the training centers are in West Virginia, so this is the only one that's in Ohio for that union. And they're going to be talking about that brand new industrial center that just opened up here in Bel Air. And then um, also next Monday, we will be closed for President's Day, but we will be open again for Tuesday. So don't let President's Day throw you off for this program. I'd like to see all of you back here. And that's it for the library announcements. So I am going to introduce our guests for tonight. We've got John Smith, who is a master carpenter and restoration guru, um, and he has also been an educator um, at a local program for many years. Uh, Jeff Forster is a metal worker, and he also teaches at that program, and Sorrel Venter is a uh, master plaster, and again, jack of all trades in restoration, and he has recently started teaching classes as well, but has been um, a mentor for many people for a very long time, including myself. So. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce or I'll let John Smith come up and start the program. Well, 
Oh, this is all pretty neat. We got some uh, propaganda. Got some propaganda on the table. This is a book that belonged to a dear friend of mine who has since passed, who has done a lot of restoration in the in the business, and I like to keep it with me. Feel like Mr. Lee's with me when I have that with me. Um, well, what is it? The question, the first question, I guess, what I would have is, what is it about this little southeast Ohio county that attracts so much people to preservation and restoration? One of the things is what Dan was talking about is that we're right smack in the middle of Appalachia. Probably there's some north and some south. But as Appalachians, and uh, everybody's grown up here and have those Appalachian genes in their, in their body, no, we don't throw nothing away. You know, Stone Fly Doctor over there, hey, we don't throw that thing away. We can use that for something someday. There's a building downtown. Hey, we might use that. In the city of Wheeling, they took a, um, they took a, a, a factory and turned it into a law office, a Bino Railroad Station, and turned it into a college. You know, we ain't throwing nothing away around here, so we got to fix it. It lays around, it lays around. In other places in America, they throw it away, bulldoze it down. So what are you going to have to restore? It's all got to be new or nothing. And sometimes new don't taste very good. So uh, preservation is, you're, you're going to hear this in all the talking about the new education and how we're steering education. You hear the words STEM all the time. That's the charter school's mantra is we're going to have STEM. We're going to have science, technology, engineering, and math. With preservation, we've got another letter. We got A. So it turns it into steam, much like the steam engines transverse the Great Stone Viaduct. And of course, the A is for art. And I don't know if all of you have been through Wheeling at some time and seen the great elephant, the great stainless steel elephant, and the artwork. That was Jeffrey Forrester's creation. And he now teaches metalworking at Belmont College. Um, and I want to add another one, you know, and, and, and being of German descent, I think I'm free to do that. What if we put an H in there and have it pronounced Sting? Because there's a lot of history involved in this. I actually have the son of my seventh grade West Virginia history teacher in the audience. Everybody that was in my class at one time or another, Aaron, I'll tell you, has heard the stories of the great Red Wilson, West Virginia history teacher in Moundsville, West Virginia, who come in the classroom on the start of the, in the very first day and said, we're not memorizing numbers here, kid. If you come in here to memorize numbers, there's a math class down the hall. We come in here to find out what, what they lied about in the history books. Uh, we're going to delve into this. We're going to find the mysteries. We're going to straighten it out. And I just, I, I just love this guy, and I love that way of thinking. We went to, um, I found out this year that he was also a substitute bus driver, one of the few teachers in Marshall County that had a job to be a substitute bus driver, but could only drive his bus to the school where he taught. So he would grab his kids up. There was a story going around. Of course, I took, I got to preface this to say that I had West Virginia history in 1963, the year that West Virginia changed all their history and upset him immensely. So he was talking about Lewis Wetzel, the famous Indian fighter, and they also named a county in West Virginia, Wetzel County. Well, it turns out in 1853, the West Virginia legislature needed to change, or the Virginia, state of Virginia legislature, needed to divide some counties. They passed a, a, a constitutional convention that said uh, one horseback's day's ride, the county seat's enough. You shouldn't take two days to get a marriage license or change a date. So they had to cut some counties. One of them they cut was Tyler County. So this famous Indian killer from Wheeling, and they, it was popular in the 1850s, they said, that'd be a good name. Let's call it Wetzel County. Well, they wrote up the bill, and the guy's name's got an H in it, W-H-E-T-Z-E-L. Legislature looks at this and says, that looks strange. We wanted it W E T Z L. No H. And so they passed a resolution, and the resolution said, whereas Mr. Wetzel was a primitive frontiersman, he probably didn't have to spell his own name. <laughs> so that left them free to spell the name the way they wanted. And they amended the uh, bill and named the county Wetzel County without the H. Red Wilson put us in a school bus and took us to the graveyard where he's planted. And every tombstone in the row have an H in it, but his and his is gone. And he turned around and announced to a group of students who were 13 or 14 years old, said, and indeed, the, legis the state legislatures today are of the same opinion that we don't know how to spell our own name. So 
So he kept that. Now, if that don't get you involved in history, if that kind of stuff don't get you get your mind turned to history, I don't know what happened. So, in 1989, uh, a governor from West Virginia, Arch Moore, had run for re-election in 1988, and he failed to get re-election. Uh, he had contacted a, a graduate of Kansas State University, a resident of Northeast Pennsylvania by the name of David Murch, and asked him to come to West Virginia and run his culture and history department. He did not get reelected, and Dave Murch was in the Valley without a job. He went to Belmont College and pitched a program for historic restoration and preservation to Belmont Technical College, and they took him up on it. That seed that Dave Murch planted grew. It started attracting students from all over the world. I've got a student back here from California who is now involved in the South, South Wheeling Historic Preservation Office and who works for Steve Avakoff of Heritage Architects and does historic architecture all over the state of Ohio. I got Aaron Ross and Bueller from Wisconsin who came here to take, the, to, to take that program and study historic restoration preservation. She is now the director of the library. This list will go on and on. I've got Sarah, South Africa. There's Jeffrey Forster from um, upstate New York, Niagara Falls. I can't tell you the town Niagara Falls is in, but that's where he's from. And uh, it, it goes up so soon. It didn't take very long after that to the locals caught on. This, hey, this, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a career opportunity here. Uh, this is a picture of Mr. Mertz. And I'm going to look around a little bit here. There's, there's Jeff Forster. There's Joe Topersey. He's on the board, the International Preservation Trades Network. Uh, Andrew Savotny, Savotny Restoration has been on TV shows all over uh, all over uh, Northeast America. He's based out of uh, Detroit, Michigan. This little girl here is from St. Clairsville, West Virginia, or St. Clairsville, Ohio. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it. Uh, and she is now taking care of the White House grounds historic for the National Park Service. Uh, the old guy up there at the top, I got no idea who the hell that is. That's Mark Segro. <laughs> Uh, beside me up there, he's a trainer at the National Park Training Center. He's from New Jersey. This guy came here from New Jersey, and now he's back to the National Park Training Center. Uh, there's Becca Carroll. She's from the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, Sarah Venter. She's done all kinds of historic preservation around the state and around West Virginia. Uh, then I've got, uh, man, there's Sarah Posen. She works for the National Park Service. This is Dave Murphy with his national, national award. That plaque is hanging in the National Park Training Center of Frederick, Maryland, on the Atkinson Wall. Uh, of course, this is Aaron. Man, I didn't see her there for a minute. But there's Aaron. Casey Hoskinson, who uh, worked for me at the shop and has forever, it seems like. And it's from um, Blair. This girl graduated from, this, from Blair High School. And ain't nobody more proud. Her Blair booster signs is all over the shop out there. I got Kim Bird back here who uh, is absolutely, probably, the best window restoration person, bar none, man or woman, that I've ever seen in 56 years working historic restoration across the United States. Um, and she's from right across the river in Wheeling. So I think I've covered almost everybody. Well, no, there's Hillary. That's Mark Segro's wife. And uh, Brian is Stephanie Wilson, Brian with City Council in Wheeling. And uh, they still do historic restoration. Huh? Next. For the next slide. Go. Casey. Here's Casey Hoskinson, a Blair resident, went through the program, being the curator at the Fort Pitt Block House in the, in the, in the Triangle of the City of Pitt, Pittsburgh. That's the oldest, oldest brick stock structure west of the Allegheny Mountains, and it's the oldest building in the city of Pittsburgh. George Washington was there three times. There she is doing the uh, Dutchman repairs, the outside logs, the gun portals. This particular beam right here came from a barn in Belmont County. It now resides in the side of the Fort Pitt Park House in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Installed there by a little girl from little girl from Blair. Uh, Kim Bird again with her stained glass. This is a church in Sadieside. Kim's an excellent stained glass artist. And she's sitting back there with Mr. Weiss, who was in the previous program, previous photo, but I'm sorry about that, Denny. <laughs> there she is. This is some of her window work. 
you know, I, I'm just going to dare you find me somebody else that can do that work. This is the turn shop. Um, this is some of our work out here. This is Derek. This is Derek, my son Derek, and me. This is Derek now teaching. He, teach, he does my job now at the field lab in, in Morristown. This is the covered bridge that we lost the 4th of July two years ago. We were doing consulting work on that. Fireworks took that bridge out um, two years ago. It was the largest span in the state of Ohio. Now it's gone. Nah. West Virginia State Capitol. This is my company. We just, uh, Kim again, we did the windows that are the dome windows in the top of this, the State Capitol building. We also did the front door. This is one Mr. Keegan Edward Jackson. He moved here from uh, Summers County, West Virginia. Summers County, West Virginia, deep in the mountains of West Virginia, brought four young boys with him who were honor, honor roll kids and excellent athletes. His oldest son, Donnie Maupin, will attest as one of the best basketball players he's seen for his age. And the, and the next one down is wrestling in the States again this year, made States two years in a row. And so they're very talented kids, AB honor roll, all four, all, both of them. Excellent children. Attracted to Belmont County. This is the, I can't say it. I'm, I wish I could tell you what that is. There's a fort in Point Pleasant. It's a French fort. And that's why I can't say it. I don't speak French. In, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Tay Shuby, some, something or other. This little girl here, she came from Iowa. Now she bought a house. She lives here. Eugene Johnson, famous restoration guy. Famous preservationist. Doing, uh, she did the wood shingle work all down there on that park. Oh, my. This is the uh, Root Mountain. I built that with an apprentice 15 years ago for the National Park Service at Root Mountain. That's my forte, this timber stuff. I love that. Next. And, of course, cover bridges. Uh, I have worked uh, 17 cover bridges with a lot of interns from Belmont College. You go to Belmont College, you're liable to find your butt on a covered bridge in the summertime somewhere in America, from Elizabeth in Tennessee all the way to uh, upstate Pennsylvania. This one here is Elizabeth in Tennessee at the bottom. The one at the top is the King's Cover Bridge in Tennessee. This is the most photographed cover bridge in the United States. This one is. And that's Derek Sineski, a uh, boy from Moundsville, West Virginia, surfing the Doe River. <laughs> <laughs> So, about, I'm going to have to look here. A year, I'm thinking it was 2000, I want, 20 years ago. I want to get that right because the uncles and the aunts of, these, of this boy. 20 years ago, I had a student in my class who had a building he needed to sell in Neffs, Ohio. It's a nephew of a couple people in the room and one of the directors of the college. I'm not going to name any names. But the guy had a building down there. He tried, he wanted to sell me, and I decided to buy it. And who knew? Who knew that day that I bought this old building? And this is what it looked like when I bought it. Uh, the Allegheny Restoration, a major restoration company from uh, West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, wanted to have a sister shop to their shop in Beckley, West Virginia, and they wanted it closely, closely uh, uh, physically to Belmont College. So they could use interns and help students get through college and pay kids in, in the middle of their terms. And so I'd let them have it. Well, I leased it to them and uh, for free. They were supposed to fix it up. And you can see they, they did. They fixed it up. And we had a good partnership there. There is the famous Mr. Archer right here standing next to Roy Underhill. <laughs> standing next to Roy Underhill, the guy I got the shop from. Uh, so... You know, if Taylor ever tells you, you don't know nobody famous, you, I got the proof he does. He was the only guy with, on the scaffold with Roy Underhill the day we were doing that timber framing. Of course, Roy Underhill's from the famous, uh, what is it, right. Woodwright, shop, right, Woodwright shop on PBS. And there's a boy from Bel Air, West, West Blair, I'm told, which is a little bit different. Uh, there's Danny Weiss, Kim Bird working on some glasses. Here's some uh, oval windows. These windows blew out of a uh, fire hall in uh tennessee niceville tennessee during a tornado and we were tasked to put them back together 
And so in this little tiny shop in Neffs, Ohio, you go out the road six miles to Neffs, Ohio, and you're liable to find the windows to a state capitol. You're liable to find oval windows from fire stations. We're, we've done the Fort Henry uh, Club windows just recently, and we're tasked to do the uh, YWCA windows in Wheeling, uh, Fort Pitt Blockhouse. Oh, there I am with Mr. Michael Mills and Tom Anderson of Allegheny Respiration and uh, Mr. Blair Lee, who's the uh, folder I have on um, courthouse top, top to courthouse. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of Hawks Nest State Park and how nasty that bugger is. So our, our little Neff shop there, the junk is, was tasked to restore this massive museum built by the 3C camp in Hawks Nest State Park in, in Central West Virginia last year. We just finished that up maybe this time last year. And there we are with the West Virginia State Capitol windows inside. In the, and then this one, that's the fire hall. This was that tornado that took the windows out and the round windows. These are the finished products to go back, all wrapped up, ready to go back down to Nashville. Oh my. So, this is, the, this is two of my students who are now the instructors, lead instructors in carpentry at the National Park Training Center. Uh, I got these guys under my wing. This is uh, employees from the National Park Training Center. Uh, all God, graduates Morgan. Of the, huh? They're all graduates of the program. All graduates of the program. And, and, and many more, uh, many more, many, many more people have graduated the program who now work for the National Program. I stopped to see these guys one day. I was going through Frederick, and I go in, and I'm talking to Mark and Mark. And I'm talking more all buddy buddies in there with Phil Davis. And all of a sudden, I heard somebody in a cubicle stick their head up and say, oh, my God, who, who, who got John Smith in here? Is that John Smith? And uh, Mark said, yes, yeah, John. They said, damn it, we're going to have to do sensitivity training again Monday. <laughs> so some of the people that... So I, I, they sent me a list. I, I called over there and got them to send me a list. Uh, I got Phil Philip Algar, who graduated in 19. Samantha Francis, who's from Shadyside, Ohio. She works at the National Park Training Center. I think she's in South Carolina. Tyler Yoder, Nate Ramser, Hillary Lennox, Mark Segro. That's Mark Segro there in 05. Mark Stafford. Both of these graduated in 05 from the program at the Belmont College. Uh, Sarah Posen. Uh, I mentioned her before. I don't see her in this picture. Uh, Eric Hutchison, Mark Slater, and Kerry Grambuski. Grambuski that's from way back in 1995. So, I don't know if I've got another slide, do I? Oh, look. I do. It's right in front of me. Son of a gun. Look at this. Edith Horton's house. Allegheny Restoration, Morgantown, deep preservation in, the West, in West Virginia and on a national stage. This is Edith Horton's house, the mount. Sets on Lennox Lake. It's in Lee, Massachusetts. There's three mansions on that. One belonged to Norman Rockwell, and the other one belonged to a guy I can't remember who was a famous writer. But Edith Horton wrote her. Edith Horton wrote her uh, novels in their Age of Innocence, and all of her novels. And I had the privilege of being the lead preservationist on that job, from from here to Lennox, Massachusetts. What a, what a, you know, what a proud thing. I'm going to say this. No, go ahead. I got to say this. If you're going to be doing historic preservation and restoration, uh, it's not the most highest paid job in construction, simply because there's unknowns. When uh, the, one of the instructors at the college drew the blueprints for this library, Bill Hooker, he's an instructor at the college too. It's pretty cut and dried. You just lay the bricks, you go ahead. Well, when we got to do restoration, we've got to go in here and find out unhidden things that are wrong that have to be fixed before Sarah can plaster. You know, before we can do this kind of stuff. So part of our pay is when I'm sitting on the Basilica in Baltimore, Maryland, on this ladder, looking at Fort McKinley, knowing that they stopped construction on this dome during the War 1812. Well, Sir Francis Scott, Scott Key was writing the Star Spangled Banner in the bay I'm looking at. And if that don't give you chills at work, you know, I don't know what kind of job you got. 
but it can't, I mean, I just can't find it. I just can't feel it. I can't, I can't describe the feeling of sitting on top of this. This also was done, uh, a lot of the work on this, uh, on these windows was done by Brian Hepburn, two twins from Jacobsburg who went through the program. That's Brian Hepburn's work. Aaron, I think you remember Brian. Yeah, he was on that job there. Now we get Mr. Forster. So now I want to introduce my buddy, Jeff Forster. The A in the STEAM. I've got the S, T, and the H. We'll get, we'll get Jeffrey up here to do some artwork. Oh. Before, before I go down at the end, if you want to push through some of this, Carol is also a, a wonderful author. And has books, uh, written two books, A Walk in the Woods and... Uh, now memory lane by Sarah. So you guys might be interested in getting a signed author. I might have a guy with an ink pen right there. I might know there's a guy in an ink pen. <laughs> this is just a um, a little. Um, I guess there was an arts uh, show down there, and yeah, people yeah, could yeah. demonstrate. I can't microphone, please. Ah, uh, you hear me now. <laughs> Okay. Um, there were uh, there were five classes that were reviewed by like nine through fourteen year old children. It was art and architecture, I believe, at Belmont College. Um, what I did is what is the way apprentices were taught is that I would say, I'm going to hit it and I want you to hit at the same spot. And then there is this intrepidation. Am I bad for doing this? You know, and I says, no, you're fine. Just go. So we took uh, just a straight rod and we did like this spiral and it was a spike for the ground and, and I had these uh, antique glass globes that they could put a can on. So uh, one girl, the one girl, uh, she first walked into class and she says, oh, fire, I'm scared of fire. By the end of the class and working with the hammer and the iron, she was like, Oh, look at that fire. Look at that stuff glowing, you know. Uh, I do encourage anybody who has a daughter or niece uh, to engage in uh, mechanical things and crafts. A woman is much more, she knows much more about the workings of things in the world, and she's much more of a stable person. This this was a uh, called a hit and sip. The the hit was not what you might think in a derogatory mean of some sort of intoxication. It, it was swinging the hammer, and the sip is we had some splits of beer. So the rules were that there were no rules. We were we cut out butterflies. Each one took a picture, drew it, and then no lines. You make lines with your hammer. You start hammering. And then you can see the look there. This was just in a couple hours. So I encourage um, the no rules. Like, for instance, children uh, are hardwired in their brain uh, more by uh, un- supervised play than in their education that the heart and the education that they get so it's really important to kind of have this freedom to express and then uh you know we grow oh okay that that i was so glad that i was you know like adjunct professor at belmont college and uh it's 1,800 pounds, uh, around the belly's 22 feet. 
And uh, it's uh, about 11 foot tall and about 14 foot long. And uh, there was a, I, I like recycling materials from past buildings. This was a, a walk-in cooler for LBs. And I got a, quite a, a, a prize of a price on it. It was a very high grade stainless steel. It's called 309L. And it's very resistant to the weather, and acids and that type of thing. So the panels were like eight foot tall and uh, like two foot wide, and they had foam in between them and then this, the skin. I got the whole thing for $150. All I had to do was scrape the foam. So stainless is quite uh, expensive. You might spend $250 for a four by eight sheet now. So I, I, I got a lot of nice materials there. So it was great that, um, Students came on and I showed them how to, we were mostly doing a lot of welding there. There's a famous, uh, if you look up um, David Smith, he's one of the most famous welded sculptures in America. <laughs> I must say that I welded more on this elephant than David Smith did in his entire, <laughs> in his entire thing. We put some major pounds of stainless steel welding wire into it. And the students like learned every crease I made, I made a special tool, almost, I made a tool that was as a point, as a point, and it went between two rounds. And I have this uh, 1920s forging hammer. And you can kind of saddle it up, put a brake on it, and you can get it going like the way an old time sewing machine goes. But this is a hundred pound weight, and it's just whoosh, and you just kind of ease in there, and you make these lines. It was quite interesting. Uh, epidermal, uh, the elephant means thick skin. It's one inch thick. That's so okay. There are some shots uh, in my shop, and uh, I, I, I had uh, someone, uh, an architect, just take slices of a digital elephant, and then he had a picture, and then it would say, like, this shape, this shape here, point at the top, goes like that, this is 10 foot, and this is like 8 foot across, and then I would just look at that, and I would make it. The uh, an artist will take a brush and see something, and they will make a line. That's it. Yep, I got it. And they will make that curvaceous or angular line or whatever. I can do the same thing. It is not taught in schools to measure by eye. Somebody could come up here if I had my tools. They could score a line. I could look at it. I could make it. Hold it up to there. A couple adjustments. And I can make 10 more just like it. The Statue of Liberty was, uh, uh, when it was rebuilt, uh, um, all the best iron workers, probably high iron workers in New York City, they were in a quandary about how do you take this shape of this skirt and in and out and it twists and it's three quarter by three. And they wanted it redone in stainless steel. They were scratching their heads. A blacksmith came in there and says, I can see that. I can do that. And he did all 2,000 ribs of three quarter by three inch stainless steel. They did it in their shop and they restored it. But that was a smith who can see. Uh, this was a project at Belmont College. All the students worked on this. And this was for a residence. Um, it was all right that I actually had a working something that had to go somewhere and had specifications. And then all the students, they all took part of it. So it was a, a fun project. Nice scroll work. Uh, that's, a, whoop, that's the uh, Schmulbach house to the right. Uh, it, it is, it, there are hearts and then there are pickets. So, uh, so that was a total, a, reproduction the only thing that is original 
is the points, is the cast points. And that's looking at the Schaefer Holiday House. And they had the thistle design there. It's quite interesting. That is cast steel or malleable iron. And the, the, the usually cast is very thick because just a little hit and it will break it. But cast steel is malleable and gives, so they can do thin sections and this beautiful thistle. And unto be known to a lot of people in history, what in my observation, down at the bottom, because that was 1884, um, there was a triangle with a star in it. And there was a big, still that strong feeling of our nations back together, uh, 1876, and that carried through different buildings. Uh, yeah, this is uh, over 100 years old, and, and this was just like several hundred rivets, you know, but it was, there was a lot of rebuilding, and, and, and I tried to preserve what was there and then add what was not. Those discs are cast. Some of them were broke. They were riveted on. You can't hit cast. So when they initially put them on, maybe they cracked them. So I don't do cast. So there's five symbols in there, which I forged out of steel. I made these hammers and these instruments, and I took those discs, and you can't tell the hand forged from the cast. What building is that on, please? Uh, that's uh, St. Alphonse's. St. Alphonse's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same as Becker. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. That's uh, that's 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 St. Al's there. And uh, there was this thing that kind of was a little pickle. I knew about it for uh, over, it was either 40 or 60 years, I don't recall, but it was a time before me and someone told me, a preservationist told me that that was just rebar for to be stuccoed in or to be plastered in, not plastered in, but, you know, mortared in. Because at one time, the girls would go up first, and a priest says, there those boys are looking up there, you know? So they covered that. So that was covered in concrete, and, it, and that further added to, like, you know, certain deteriorations. But it was, it was a good restoration. I'm glad to do it. This is, uh, this is uh, St. Joseph's Cathedral. I have two projects I did there. And uh, they were looking for a reproduction, which is exactly like what we have. So, uh, so I made these, uh, I don't recall if it was four or six lanterns, but uh, on the top, it, it's kind of esoteric to know. It, it is a tapered spike, and it's 18 inches tall. And typically, if you have an eight-sided, a hex side, you can hit this side and you forge the other. This is six-sided. So it's quite tricky to hit, and then you have a point on the other side. So uh, it, it, was a, it was a good challenge, I think. So uh, this is the uh, children's home. And uh, this was a fundraiser for them. So I put different elements in there, but if, if, if you could see close, it is engraved very nicely. I had someone who had a very good hand with a wand in engraving, uh, and they did you know, fluid cursive lines over it. And uh, I mean, the birds were 15,000 for a donation. The blocks were 25,000. The apples were 10, <laughs> and if he could get in for a leaf, that would be like around a $2,500 range. But uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate the form. I try to do the balance of the yin, or the female, and the male strength, and then together they make this impressive ornamentation. Uh, these were col uh, columns down in uh, Fairmont College. Uh, they, they were well over 100 years old, I believe. And uh, they were a mix. They were cast iron on the top. 
and they had riveted them together because they it was just a cheap way to go instead of get a, buying a threaded bolt. But then that pressure in places, they cinched the rivet too tight and they cracked the cast. So then I had to rebuild and, or, or fix them and somehow. And then the, the, the skirted part was uh, steel that was rolled, kind of like, uh, I don't want to compare a garbage can to it, but you've seen that fluted tapers. So I'd waited four years. I had known that th this is a zinc monument for Captain John McClure. He was uh, a rank of, uh, uh, he was a, a Navy rank of Commodore, which they don't have anymore. And that was right below a rear admiral. He was on troop transport during the uh, Civil War. So this was, uh, they had all types of, uh, Rebecca was doing just like a renowned, uh, fantastic job and heading up and, and, and they had all, they had marble, they had granite, they had sandstone, they had all these different stones. And they says, Jeff, can you uh, fix uh, zinc? <laughs> So the top was knocked off with the branch. It was 12 foot tall. And then the grave people or grounds people, they had this open area like from where the top is off there. And they just filled it up with extra mud and stones. And that filled up with water and it blew this soft metal up, kind of like a balloon. So here I was, you know, uh, I had uh, numerous fissures and cracks that were or solders, which is fine, it, it solders easily. But then I had to move the metal in so it's soft, but it may break. So I had this 20 pound sledgehammer with a square face. And uh, yeah, it is a weight to haul, but the biggest thing is when you hit something like rubber, <laughs> that's in the dense material and durometer, it bounces back. So you get that, I, I had quite a good workout on this. It was interesting just looking, though, too. Um, if you look, the uh, Victorians layered uh, symbols, and they would try to get you to move somehow, find out what's interesting to you or what is emotional to you. If you look here, there. at the top, it, it is maybe an ascending, maybe the Virgin Mary. So you think religion, so you're like, you know. And then if you look at it again, the two deep things are furrows under a very sad eye and there's a nose and kind of a mouth going down. So then they had, you know, sorrow. So then again, when you turned it to the side, this had kind of a little bit of an hourglass shape. It was like the robes maybe that Roman times they would wear and then then you saw the softness so it was like an s symbol so any one of those would kind of say whoa <laughs> you get kind of you're kind of shocked at these layers but many times ornament is used and then other things are, are there to pull you in to say and to fix your eye okay So I was working up on the uh, monument and I could see the suspension bridge. I was in Mount Wood working on a 12 foot monument. I just started, no one knew I was there. I had no schedule or except for my own. And uh, like I says, I waited four years for the commission to come up. So this, I got a call from this house on the day that I was <laughs> I was working on that obelisk, and when I, I said, sure, I'll come down. She says, you want me to look at her wrought iron fence, which was mangled. And for four years, she was pestered by the, uh, the, the fence that was twisted. She was very orderly. So what happened was, when I walked up to the house, the house said, uh, 
Phillips McClure. And then she asked me, she says, uh, I looked at her fence and stuff, and she says, well, what were you doing before I called you? <laughs> and I says, well, I was working on the McClure monument up in the graveyard. And it is clear sight down to this building. It's the highest point on Mount Wood. So sometimes uh, very, um, it's not scary. It's just kind of a, a wonderful thing that happened and along the way. Sarah's up. Well, I, 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 I did uh, wear my top button up, maybe thought I'm styling, but really I was just going back to uh, a man in the 19th century. He would not, no matter how hot he was, undo his top button because that was not a good show in public. Thank you very much. What a great group of people. Aaron, if I take this off, I'm going to cause chaos. You can see the upcoming slides on the laptop. How's that? Can everybody hear me? I am afraid I'm suffering from uh, effects of a cold this evening. So uh, if you do not hear me, and I'm also hard of hearing, so I really understand not hearing. So if you do not hear me, please speak up and raise your hand and I can uh, make sure I am in. What a great group of people here this evening. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Um, I bet I know of at least a few things we have in common uh, for being here. Uh, I bet that uh, we believe that the things have meaning and that there is continuation. Um, I believe that we have in common that we relate and we learn through stories and that we tell each other stories. Uh, and I believe that we have value in, in what we do and we have found value in what we we give value in life. Um, <clears throat> this area of the world has attracted me. Uh, I am from South Africa and I have come here um, voluntarily. Um, <clears throat> America was a choice. Uh, West Virginia was a quality of life decision for me. Uh, Wheeling was uh, an attraction due to Belmont. Um, my trade needs people who think like-minded and have like-minded skills, and that attracted me to Belmont. Um, <clears throat> we, to give you an explanation of what I think of um, continuation in my life, my father was a boat builder. Um, in 1820, way before my father was born, obviously, a three-mast schooner sailed into the harbor in Port Elizabeth in Algoa Bay and in a sudden storm was dismasted. The, um, the boat was deemed irreparable after the storm. The mast had broken. They did not have trees big enough to be to make the masts. And the, um, the teak timbers, huge teak timbers, were used to uh, make the roof of a local church. In the 1970s, when my father was around, uh, the church was abandoned, and he bought those same teak timbers from that roof, and he built himself a two-mast schooner, which he sailed to America. And although I did not sail on the boat, this is very definitely how I came to be here. And I can make very definite lines in history as to meaning and continuation. I remember very well in the uh, summer of 1986, um, working on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay in restoring the carcass of a Chesapeake skipjack, which unlike it's another boat, you know, it's, it's, it's the same trade in a different continent, uh, different woods, different materials, same trade. Um, the, um, the backbone of which all of our culture of preservation and restoration exists is a folklore, is a, is a, uh, a national basis of a collection of stories, of knowledge, of bases um, that we need to share. And this is best done when people are pulled together and like-minded people share the same space and share the same headspace. Belmont has been this for a very long time. And uh, we see the results of that. <clears throat> and um, 
the results of all of this, um, due to the nature of what we're doing, it can never be any different. Um, we come to a, a problem, uh, which is a building in bad repute, and it needs to be repaired. And you need to understand where that building came from, how it was built, how it was made, why it was made, and what processes it was made, and what principles it was made with. And those same need followed. And the same procedure always follows. Um, you know, several alternatives come about. You need to find a method of repairing it. Um, you need to get through an experimentation process, of which is the best, best process to follow to, to attain that method. And then there is a routine process to be followed afterwards until the, the project is done. Um, this has always been the same, but without that knowledge, without that, that history, without that knowing that things are different and treating it differently, uh, that simply cannot happen. Um, I am very honored to be in, in Belmont County tonight. Uh, I feel myself very much the beneficiary of what has been started by many others, much more much more attuned to, to their past and um, uh, very much caring about what they do. Um, I am very glad to have contributed a little bit to that and I'd be happy to show you some of, of what we've done uh, with some of those people in between here. Uh, this is a shot in our workshop as one of our columns, uh, one of many columns that's been restored in the area. Uh, this particular one um, <clears throat> was the victim of a, uh, a car accident. Uh, the lady of the house uh, reversed a little bit too far and um, and collapsed a, a very 20 foot high column, which was then meticulously, and I mean it was splintered. Uh, so we had splinters picked up and we actually glued the same splinters back again to make the same column again. Um, on the right hand side, we are making um, <clears throat> reproduction GFRC pieces for the port share at Stifle. Um, before new pieces can be made, um, you need to make an original out of plaster so that um, you can make a mold to cast the, the pieces in GFRC. Um, and um, throughout that project, we used people that graduated from Belmont as well uh, in, in that process. Um, here we are doing one of my very favorite things. Um, it doesn't make any sense when you look at it. We are plastering over dry uh, over wallpaper. But um, what we are doing is teaching do-it-yourselfers the hand skill of how to apply uh, plaster onto a flat wall. Uh, people, uh, do-it-yourselfers, for the most part, think that they are not able to finish plaster. And uh, it's always very nice to find out that, um, yes, it is, it's been done Throughout the ages, um, you know, your flat hand is a trial. And if you go to Africa today, you'll see mud huts being plastered today with a flat hand. Uh, having a steel piece that's a little bit wider and flatter just makes it so much easier. But anytime you pass a flat piece over the same area three times in three different directions, you have a flat piece of wall. And there's always an aha moment when you get people to realize that, no, this is not some mystery thing we can teach you how to repair the plaster in your own house. And we do do those classes often, and this was a snapshot in one of those, those classes. <clears throat> um, we had a group of about 12 people working on different areas, and um, uh, I think a lot of fun was had by all. And I think without a doubt, uh, every single one of them could figure out uh, what to do and are doing the same on their own houses at this time. Oh, um, well, this brings back some memories. Um, this was a house in Morgantown, um, um, plaster repair in an attic. Uh, was a very rough space to start off with. It ended up being into a very elegant space. The, um, here we have a group of visitors in the shop, I think, uh, while we were doing uh, terracotta replacements in GFRC. Um, this is some of uh, Belmont graduates um, that did an excellent job in restoring a, um, um, a monastery. Um, in um, the, uh, a lot of work was done. Uh, if you can see the upper portion, there was a lot of woodwork that needed uh, revarnished. Uh, a lot of scaffolding was built, and then all of the 
the woods that they're working on right now, which is Plaster of Paris, was all cracked up and had needed repaired uh, and refinished. And here we are at the Scottish Art Cathedral, and we are repairing a sections of the theater um, that had some water damage. Um, there's both a bulkhead, and if you see the Egyptian head on your left-hand side, right behind uh, the guy's face, You'll see that that was uh, also rebuilt and uh, refinished. Uh, this and before and after of that project. Um, <coughs> these were um, on the right hand side, the brown column, uh, the capitals, you can see these were terracotta capitals. Um, <coughs> these were, um, I believe, the Rono County Courthouse. Um, it's not quite as evident, but those are about four feet across, so they're pretty large capitals. They were, were terracotta, but they got severely degraded, so we remade them, made a mold of them, and um, cast them in GFRC, which is glass fiber uh, reinforced concrete, which is the gray portion on the left. Uh, eventually, all four of them were replaced in the same vein. Um, making molds and replacing uh, this is quite a common thing. You might have seen the same process happening at Fort Hendrick Club downtown Wheeling uh, not too long ago. We did that project as well. This is a, uh, well, a lot of stories here. <clears throat> uh, columns at Ogilvy, uh, which were replaced um, probably about 15 years ago, suddenly showed a whole lot of degradation and a lot of rot, as you can see on the left-hand side. And everybody was um, very puzzled as to why it happened. Um, and I was puzzled until I got wet one day because I was working out there and I found out that their automatic sprinkler systems were set to wet the columns twice a day. <laughs> and um, so that is what caused the, the rot to start off with. Um, now, of course, with that amount of rot, your choices are either you replace the whole column, which is a shame because you've got 20 feet of perfectly good column and just the bottom is bad, um, in this case, we replaced it with a, um, a GFRC base and then a, an inset of epoxy uh, to bridge where you lost the pieces. Um, and an added story to this is that when we did the, um, uh, replace the columns at, or repair the columns at Fort Henry Club downtown Wheeling, we were able to use the old columns, the original columns that was replaced in this process. Um, more than 15 years ago, uh, we used pieces of that and replaced that as infill pieces to replace what was missing at the Fort Henry Club. They had the same configuration. <clears throat> oh, um, beautiful little building. You probably all know where this is. Um, this is um, uh, beautiful. What is what is this called again? What is that? What is the, 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 what store is it called? Bone store. Bone store. There you go. There you go. Thank you. This is the bone store. And uh, it was a victim of placement. If you can look at the right hand side, how close we are to the main road. And um, what they did not consider when they laid out the roads at that time was fracking. Uh, fracking would come about, which would bring large trucks. And when the trucks made the big turn around, um, at the stop that was right there, it pushed the building over and it racked the building. And um, uh, again, with um, pupils and graduates from Belmont, we were able to uh, uh, get it back into shape, uh, remake the, the windows in front and, um, uh, and put it all back together again. Very enjoyable project. Nice folk out there. Uh, this is a very common project for us to do. This is a, a restoration of uh, core bells and um, architectural detail on front of, uh, of buildings. Um, we are in the process of doing quite a few of those right now. This is uh, Friends of Wheeling House, um, uh, before and after. Um, I think that's some snow, and I think we have a Belmont graduate standing right there in the snow. Um, the, uh, and I think as they are just about to finish on that portion of the sidewalk, it's about to have another go at it. Um, this is um, yeah, a source object on Carmel Monastery. Um, 
which is, was at that stage and is still in, in dire need of restoration and has gone through, I'm sorry to say, quite a few um, uh, apparent saviors and is still looking for a savior today. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of um, plaster restoration necessary. These are exterior, to, uh, exterior stucco, of course, so that is a very hard um, lime and Portland plaster mixture that is degrading there. This is the, the White Palace as it was probably five years ago, six years ago maybe. Time flies. Oh, it might be longer. Time flies. Um, <clears throat> this is the, um, the first capital building downtown, um, right next to the city building. Um, again, it needed um, uh, a new stucco coat on the outside, but um, being conscious of what it was, and what he needed to make sure that it, it, it stayed very porous and very open. Um, if you pass by the building today, right after a rain, I'm sure you can see that some portions of it is very wet, and some portions of it is white already as it's dried, and it dries very mottled. And the reason for that is that there's no paint involved at all. That is all just uh, stucco that you're seeing, and it's a very open system. It's meant to very, be very breathable. <clears throat> This is a bank building in um, western West Virginia with a lot of um, ornament, plaster ornamentation on the ceiling, a very high work. Um, uh, relatively simple repairs, but, uh, but a very ornate work and very unusual to see in, in this part of the country. Um, but again, it's just an idea of some of the variety of the stuff that we did get into. Um, this is our own theater here in, in, in Wheeling. Um, and um, in this case, we had a plaster damage uh, from, from a large uh, uh, leak in the ceiling. And um, here we are highlighting some um, gold leaf details that hadn't been highlighted in a long time. And actually, people, you really couldn't see that it was back there. But we're just highlighting and bringing it back together again. There's a lot of work coming up at the, the Capitol, and we'll be doing a lot more of that in, in the near future. And this is a, um, a dear project in my heart. This is a um, St. Patrick's Church in Western West Virginia. Um, we did a complete interior replastering. Um, this is a funny project, um, one of those many stories, but uh, the project already been bid out by the time I got a hold of it. Um, and when they, f when they came to the conclusion that the contractor who, who, who did the job really did not know how to do it, um, and they had no idea of the amount of damage that they had. Um, the amount of damage was at least tenfold of what they thought they had, uh, which is typical with plaster. Uh, but we ended up replacing about a third of all of the entablature around the um, around the building, uh, all the decorative plaster work, and that was, was an immense amount of work. Um, very enjoyable, uh, don't get me wrong, and we ended up uh, closing the church down everywhere from from Christmas, I think, till Easter. And um, the, um, <clears throat> um, it, during that period, uh, we worked 14-hour uh, days, uh, six days a week. It was a very, very, very strenuous time. Um, as you can see from the scaffolding and the way that everything was set up in there, I think we had three lifts running in there. Uh, all of our pieces were being manufactured on the floor. It was very enjoyable, very chaotic, uh, very busy time. Uh, the kind of things you only dream of. <clears throat> this, um, boy, there's a story here. So um, the church had a, a nave, and there were paintings on that. And um, we can't see the original uh, paintings here now. And it's probably a good thing because they were pretty cartoonish. But um, they decided that they wanted these repainted, and they wanted a, a um, proposals on, on what this would look like. And um, there was a, um, a consulting firm involved at the time that had their favorite artists uh, that made a sketch that they were pushing to do this with. But um, Erin right here came up with uh, her own design, which she did to show as a sketch, but she actually projected on the ceiling. So what you're seeing there is a picture projected in real time on the ceiling of what the final would look like. And this is finally what they accepted. And she 
uh, painstakingly executed that over the next several months. Um, <clears throat> this is the final project once she was, was done with it. And um, if, uh, if you're not involved uh, with something like this on a daily basis, I can attest to the fact that this is not a common thing to do. This is not an easy thing to do. And uh, it caused many, many a, a heartache and many, many a long night and many, many a nightmare along the way. Um, because as you can imagine, you have got many, many different opinions in the church and many in the, in the church structure, all of which want to change you this way, that way, and the other way. And um, uh, finally, um, when uh, push came to shove, we just had to close the whole thing down and say we're closed until we're done. And when we're done, we took the stuff and we're done and said this is it. <laughs> and they were they were very happy with the results as you can see it was a fantabulous job um, if um, can you believe that that work was done by a graduate of Belmont in, in this area I mean it's, it's, it's amazing and here we're back to the beginning and I think that's um, that's my sign to wrap things up and, uh, and come to a conclusion <laughs> I gotta say both these guys are entirely too modest. I was doing the West Virginia State Capitol and they'd lost some brass panel, little brass buttons on the door to say push or pour, pull on the door. And I didn't know where to find them. Nobody could find them. No one could find them with the general contractor. I said, give me two of them, push, pull. I sent them to Sarah, what was it, a week? Sarah, a week you sent them back, done. Sarah, the, uh, the push, pull things you made for me at the State Capitol. In a week, you sent them back, and we still don't. I got some at the house. Nobody knows. You can't tell the difference. I mean, this stuff here with the um, with the angels in the top that, that Aaron down. We were invited to um, Frederick, Frederick, Maryland, the training center for her to give a demonstration on how they just cutting edge. We're talking about cutting edge technology, <laughs> born right here in Belmont County. So I just want you all to know. Next time you're filling up with gas at the Kroger. Or uh, walking through the, the, you know, walking through the aisles of Kroger, you never know. Someone might be in the aisle. Someone might be in the aisle next to you. That that, that was trusted, it was trusted to restore the national treasures of the United States of America. I'm so proud of all. I'm so proud of this whole place. We're we're open to any kind of questions. Anybody got any questions? Sure. Do you remember the name of the girl in the upper left hand corner picture? Who was at the White House now? Yeah, it was Brianna Hummel. Brianna Hummel. Brianna Hummel. That's exactly who it is. Yeah, she's there now, huh? Yeah, this is just a sample of the, the, the students that are now taking care of, you know, America's history. Carol Richardson. Yeah, who's, who's the you know the curator and director of Monticello? Uh, you mean the the projections? Um, it was. I had it. Uh, I took a photo of the space and then I imported that in uh, to Photoshop. And then I used that as a template and put layers over the top of it so that each one could be manipulated in real time. So if they said, you know, we want it to be bronze instead of gold, I could change the color to match it. And if we want the ropes to be this color instead of that, I could change it right there in real time. Instead of having to go back and do sketch, you know, multiple sketches, we could just manipulate it all at the same time right there from my laptop. And they could see what it would look like in the space instead of on a little piece of paper because a lot of times you see it on paper it looks great and then you get it up big and it doesn't look like what you think it's going to do so that's that was basically it was it was to change to stop the change orders from happening <laughs> down the line and be a money saver is what it was designed to do because you know on that job alone we had had several things where we would go and put in the time and the money for the materials and then they'd say well that's not what we thought it was going to look like we want to change it and so this was just a way to avoid all of that those costs down the line is that we get 
them to sign off on it right there and take a photo of what it looked like, and then we can work off of it from there. Is the program going strong now still? Um, yeah, it's, it's still, uh, it's in transition now because Dave Mertz is, is retiring. This is last semester, but they are interviewing at this time for a uh, new chair of the program. And uh, we think we've got some people lined up. It looks like a promising figure. We've got some grant money from the state, uh, $500,000 to build a new uh, shop out there for them. So it looks like, it looks like we're going to be able to keep the program. It seems like such an unsung hero. Look at the people that attracts to the Valley. What other program, nursing, what other program attracts so many talented people? To the Ohio Valley, and, and we're all sharing in their wealth. The last thing I got to say is we went first full circle from me talking about my um, uh, West Virginia history teacher. The very end is Aaron had the opportunity to, when we're working in the West Virginia Supreme Court, to sit down at the desk where Abraham Lincoln signed the papers to make West Virginia a state. That's full, full circle on my part. I right, thank you. All. Oh man! You're going to draw the ticket, so you see. Uh, Somebody going to bring the. Uh, yeah, the white tub is the door prize. Where's the white tub? It's everything right up against the wall. Oh, okay. So, well, what do you girls uh, come up and do the honors? Um, is Dave Mertz, uh, Dave Mertz is apparently still there, and uh, I want to tell you, uh, when you go back and you see Dave tomorrow, uh, we had Dave down here in uh, 2003 for the uh, bicentennial of the state of Ohio, and we had a number of exhibits up in the park, and one of the things that was done in the park was the uh, cutting of the stone for the Great Stone Viaduct. And so Dave agreed to come down and uh, portray a stonemason. And he chiseled 1803 in a, in a piece of sandstone. And at the end of the day, he said, here, do you want this? And I said, well, sure, I'll take it. Make sure Dave knows that that sandstone with his carving 1803 is in my yard by the wagon wheel. Let him know it's still there. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, John, no. you've pulled the ticket. I can't get out of this one? Uh, yeah, that one, that one is the charcuterie board. Yeah. Yes. When we not your pull one in here. Yes. Well, I'm not looking at the jar. There you go. Okay, we are ready with the white ticket 6609-777. Here we go. Very good. Congratulations. And one of these two. And this one. What's this next one for? The blue ticket is the door prize. The blue ticket is the door prize. Everybody get your blue tickets. 953 2398. There we go. Read them a lot. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you next week, uh, same time, same day. Thanks for coming. Don't forget uh, Jim Cochran's back there. He's got a lot of nice things that you can look at on your way out and take some money out of your pocket and share your wealth. <laughs> Thank you for coming.